Hey guys, so it, it is a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Silva. She uh, was my attending uh, 15 years ago when I first started medical school. Um, makes me feel so old to think about that, but... Um, How about me? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, one thing that was um, amazing about her was that she fostered my, my interest and, and my career. So when I was a fourth-year medical student, um, she... Um, so the, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association came to Puerto Rico for their annual meeting, and she um, supported my attendance to, to that conference, and then started having conversations about introducing LGBT issues within the medical cur curriculum. Um, fortunately, I then left for residency, so I'm, I don't know what happened after that, but I'm hoping that uh, uh, the first steps that we took at that point um, was um, it was just a first step for m many amazing things. But in more formal terms, Dr. Silva is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine. Uh, she has worked domestically and internationally to develop curricula for medical students and residents. She received an award from the American Medical Association for her work on the front lines in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, and it's, it is my pleasure to in, introduce uh, Dr. Silva. So thank you, and thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to all of you. I did not come alone. I came with my peers, Dr. J.P. Sanchez. Um, he is an associate professor of emergency medicine at Rutgers University and Glenn Garcia who is a fourth year medical student at Rutgers also because they participated or I participated with them in developing this module and I'm going to first leave Dr. JP to give you a couple of introductions. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I just want to um, thank Downstate for hosting um, Dr. Silva. Dr. Silva will be presenting this at seven medical schools um, in New York uh, during Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations. I just wanted to also, um, this um, session is a part of a larger national initiative um, to diversify the authors, reviewers, and editors of journals. Um, so this workshop will be submitted to one of the journals of the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges. If you're not aware, the AAMC, um, really, you give a lot of money to the AAMC. You will give a lot of money to the AAMC um, ever since you completed the MCAT. And they support two journals. One is Meded Portal and Academic Medicine. Um, as um, one of the board members of the Journal of Academic Medicine. I want to encourage you to submit letters to the editor um, by October 7th. It's a special call specifically for medical students, residents, and fellows to co-author letters to the editor on first experiences during health professions education. And you can follow up with Dr. Sola and Dr. Budin Foster to review your letters to the editor. Um, Meded Portal, um, which this workshop will be submitted to, is a open access journal Anyone can access it for free to download curriculum. How many of you are familiar with Meded Portal? Okay, two or three hands. We want everyone to become familiar with Meded Portal. We have a collection on diversity, inclusion, um, and health equity. You can pull curriculum to be integrated into undergraduate medical education, resident uh, education, or faculty development around unconscious bias, health disparities, holistic emissions, and so forth. And we have a particular call for submissions on Native American um, health. Um, and we have over 100, oh my God, 100 um, modules in Meded Portal where you can download curriculum content. Um, and many of these modules have been co-authored by medical students. How many of you are medical students? Okay, the vast majority, excellent. Um, so as I'm just giving additional, a couple additional words, please remember, just complete the pre-survey, which is page one and two. If you could complete the pre-survey one and two, and before you leave, then three and four, which is the post-assessment. 
Um, so optimizing scholarship. So as I mentioned, I'm the executive director for LMSA National, which has 130 chapters. So optimizing scholarship means how do you get the most bang for your buck? So when you go um, to LMSA or SNMA or PAMSA, regional and national conferences, you're there not only to learn, but to promote scholarship. So as mentioned, um, this is one example. Dr. Sirva was invited to talk to uh, students at seven medical schools. She's going to um, utilize this process and evaluation data to support her publication to Medit Portal. Um, and this is in support of Hispanic Heritage Month across the country. How many of you are supporting Black History Month or involved in planning for Black History Month? OK, great. Or Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month? Or LGBT Pride Month? or Women's History Month. There's a whole lot of heritage months that go on in the year, right? And you're a part of that process, and all of these can be opportunities to support scholarship. Then you're going to go and share what you did at the LMSA, SNMA, AMWA, AMA conferences, right? That makes it a twofer. Then you're going to submit it to Medit Portal. That makes it a threefer. And then you're going to take the curriculum and you're going to share it with college students in the pipeline and pathway programs, right? Because it's not only about your education, but those people who are coming up behind you to be future medical students and residents. So that's how you optimize success. I want to thank all the institutions who are supporting this initiative. And with no further ado, Dr. Silva. Well. Again, I would like to thank um, SUNY Downstate for the invitation, especially you, because I know that if you're here is that you care about improving the health care of um, your patients, specifically Hispanic population. And today I'm going to show you in a way how you can participate with us and you know, motivate your faculty to do this kinds of workshops with you. And I'm gonna leave Mr. Glenn Garcia, the fourth year medical student from Rutgers, he's going to give you the introduction to the workshop and then I will complete the rest of the workshop. Thank you. Has everyone completed the pre? Yeah. On page one and two. Hmm? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. So these are the learning objectives that we're going to go through today. Right? We're going to describe the history of Puerto Ricans right, and Puerto Rican identity within the United States, compare and contrast health disparities for Puerto Ricans in the United States and on the island, and explain how at least one state and their federal policy actually impacts the health of these populations. And then we're going to look into healthcare access problems. Right? And some of you may be thinking, why Puerto Ricans? Um, Kings County, Brooklyn is actually one of the largest uh, populations of Puerto Ricans in the country, right? followed by the Bronx and then now Orange County, which is Orlando, Florida. So it's actually really awesome that we're here at Downstate. All right, so this is our agenda. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to start out with the introduction of Puerto Rican history identity information, and then I'm going to leave it to uh, Dr. Silva uh, to go over the, uh, the details for the health statistics of Puerto Ricans and then we're gonna go into the case discussion. All right, so we're gonna begin with some history. So about 5,000 years ago, the Tainos left the area that we now call Venezuela, and they island hop all the way up to Puerto Rico, right, which they called Borican. And that's actually today, well, you'll hear some people say, oh, yeah, I'm Boricua, instead of just saying, oh, I'm Puerto Rican, because uh, a Boricua is someone from Borican. And after about, 5,000 years of history, then you have uh, 1493, the Spanish come, right, at the beginning of the end, so to speak, and the Spanish colonization of Puerto Rico began 1493. They weren't allowed to actually use the natives as slaves. So what you ended up happening was about 1516, there is a smallpox epidemic, and in 1517, the African slave trade begins in Puerto Rico. All right, so that uh, through intermarriages, you see this, this new culture form, and you actually get the loss of the Taino civilization. All right, and then fast forward 400 years, we have the Spanish-American War. 1898, the Treaty of Paris ends the Spanish-American War and gives Cuba, Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico to the United States. They actually all four became US territories. 
Puerto Rico and Guam are the only ones that are still territories today. And the U.S. kind of had trouble figuring out what to do with these populations. So in 1900, they set up a civilian government. And then the Supreme Court dealt with all these cases, like, what are the rights that these people have, right? They're not Americans, right, because they were Spanish, and now they're Puerto Rican, so they're not, right? they weren't us, right? They weren't American at that point in history. So the Supreme Court decided in these series of cases, which became known as the insular cases, that Puerto Rico would be separate from and unequal to the United States, right? And this decision basically said that the Constitution didn't apply uh, to the United States in the, uh, in the same way that it applies to Puerto Rico, right? So certain things just didn't apply for uh, the population of Puerto Rico. And that will actually lead to some of the modern day problems where Medicaid and Medicare don't reimburse Puerto Rico at the same rate, despite Puerto Ricans on the island paying into it at the same rate. Right, then 19, uh, 1917, we have the Jones Act, and that's when Puerto Ricans became American citizens. So it was a period of about 20 years where they were part of the United States, but they weren't American citizens. Right? And then 1952 is where we see the Commonwealth status start. And that's actually the status that we have today. We had the election of a Puerto Rican governor for the first time. It was 1948. And that's going to be um, what leads to this creation where the United States says that Puerto Rico is no longer a colony. It's called a Commonwealth or not incorporated territory. So some of the things that are also going to affect the health, right, in addition to the history and the politics, of course, is going to be the food. The Tainos brought with them from South America, things like yuca, corn, uh, and, the, and the modern pestle way of cooking, right, which Puerto Ricans call it pilon, just mashing everything. And we also had the barbecue cooking. So putting everything on the grill comes from the, uh, the native populations. Right, from the Africans, we have plantains, which we used to make mofongo and tostones, which are pictured. And um, in addition to plantains, bananas and gandules, arroz gandules is one of the staples of the Puerto Rican diet. And from the Spanish, we actually have pork, beef, right, wheat, and olive oil, uh, rice, wheat, and olive oil. And beef and pork are actually interesting because that's how the Spanish would colonize a colony, right? They would take uh, cattle, they would take pigs and they drop it off there and they come back later once they procreated. That way the colonists would have a source of food. Then the U.S. comes in, brings a lot of awesome things, pizza, hamburgers, french fries, fast food establishments all over the island. And um, so, you know, if you haven't been to Puerto Rico, you'll definitely find something familiar down there. Um, and that also factors into the diet. So just in terms of the genetic makeup, Right, the, the Puerto Rican genome, so to speak. About 65% of it is European or Middle Eastern. Right? And where does the Middle Eastern come from? Spain was occupied by the Moors for centuries. Right? So there's the mixing of the blood, and so that's why you know, if you're Puerto Rican, you do a DNA test or Latin American in general, there will be some history from the Middle East. Um, Sub-Saharan African makes up about 20%. Native American, right? a lot of people say that, oh, the natives were extinguished in Puerto Rico. But even recent DNA studies have shown that there are a lot of native uh, indigenous markers left from the Tainos in our DNA. And then the other 3%, uh, people from all around the world have actually immigrated to Puerto Rico. So it's a big mix of cultures. Now Dr. Silva is going to talk to us more about the health status of Puerto Ricans. Thank you, Glenn. So why do we all need to know about the health care status of Puerto Ricans in the island since um, you are all here in the mainland, and by mainland we mean the 50 states, and of course the island is self-explanatory. So the population of Puerto Rico has decreased from 3.7 million in 2010 to 3.1 million um, estimated for 2018, and most of this decrease is due to migration here to the mainland. And this is why it is really important for all of us to know what are the causes of morbidity and mortality? What are the health disparities of Puerto Ricans in the island? And the risk factors of Puerto Ricans in the island begin with their living conditions. 92% of our municipios or counties are cataloged as medically underserved areas by the federal government. The top 10 poorest counties in the US are in Puerto Rico and 44.4% of our population lives in poverty. In 2003 and 17, sorry, three of the five highest causes of mortality 
were the same or directly related to the top three chronic conditions, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, stroke, mortality, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, again, diabetes, chronic conditions. And of course, risk factors for death and disability can mostly be predictable based on what you just saw. High fasting plasma glucose, dietary risk, high body mass index, high blood pressure, and alcohol use. Almost everything we've discussed kind of is associated with the diet we have. It's called Cocina Criolla. It's a Creole diet, and it's delicious, but it's very high in fat and in starch. So we need to keep in mind that Puerto Ricans from the island will come here and preserve our identity and our traditions. And health conditions that we need to keep in mind, diabetes is the first one. Um, as you appreciated, diabetes is a huge problem for Puerto Ricans specifically. Puerto Ricans in the island have 50% higher prevalence and three times the death rate of others in the U.S. And mainland Puerto Ricans, the prevalence is even higher. And when you get a Puerto Rican from the island, you really do need to think that we get Aedes aegyptus as an endemic mosquito. So we get lots of viruses associated, dengue, fever, Zika, chikungunya, and the health issues associated with natural disasters, which are poor access to health care and treatment of chronic diseases, poor hygiene, and increased risk of infectious diseases, and mental health issues. And we are going to use Hurricane Maria, because I guess everybody knows about Hurricane Maria in 2017, as an example. So when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017, hospital access was limited. A lot of people could simply not get to their hospitals and to get health care. Most of the dialysis centers lost their power, so our dialysis patients could not get dialysis for a very long time. There was an increase in leptospirosis infection, and I actually got to see people just you know, walking without shoes with stagnated um, water. For, so we knew, we knew this was coming like a week after the hurricane. And then there were increases in suicide, anxiety, and depression. And studies were done, uh, and they found that the PTSD incidence was higher for patients relocating to Florida, 67% versus 44% for those staying in the island. And those are the patients that relocated to you. And also, in another study, it was found that lack of English proficiency increased the mental distress of those uh, migrating right after the hurricane. And a critical part of Puerto Rican history and our identity are the migration trends. And just going really fast through them because we've been migrating since the um, 20th century. And the first migration was due to the recession in the US. And if imagine the conditions in the US, then imagine the conditions in an island that was already poor. So the US believed that the reason was overpopulation and gov the government sponsored emigration and sterilization. So there was government sponsored sterilization um, and studies surrounding that going on in Puerto Rico. And then during the um, 1940s to 1960s, Operation Bootstrap caused the Great Migration, and that was um, a project from the US Congress to industrialize Puerto Rico. So there were lots of companies going to Puerto Rico because there was a, a tax um, break, a tax exemption, actually. And there were lots of jobs created, but you do know what happened when and not everybody had a job. So agricultural jobs were lost. and people started migrating to the U.S., specifically here to New York. One of the first enclaves was here in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and that's when Puerto Rican identity started mixing in the U.S. mainland. And then um, when we look at the rest, here it is, the rest of our history in terms of uh, migration, Important to know that in 2006, the tax cuts were um, taken out. So all those corporations left Puerto Rico and jobs left too. 
So that was another migration spike. And the last one was Hurricane Maria. So from 2006 to 2018, more than half a million Puerto Ricans came here to the States. And doctors migrate at a really higher rate than anybody else in the island. So to help doctors stay, the Congress of Puerto Rico passed Law 17 of um, 19, law, law 14 of 1917, which gives a tax exempt of 4% tax break to all doctors that provide 180 hours of community work to underserved populations for the next 15 years. It is not available to some primary cares, but to all specialists and subspecialists, if they are. And how many Puerto Ricans live here? Well, there are around 5.5 million, but by the end of this year, that was the last time a census was done, but by the end of this year, there's gonna be around 6.1 million, which means you are going to have double the population of Puerto Ricans than they are in the island. And where do they live? In traditional enclaves, like we already talked about, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. But it's interesting because in the last few years, Puerto Ricans from the island and the mainland, and by the way, most Puerto Ricans here were born here. They were not, you know, they were born in the mainland. Um, have been going to new enclaves in Florida, Texas, and the southeast, and that's, again, because of job loss in the traditional enclaves. So what is the health of Puerto Ricans here in the mainland? Well, it is not good. In a survey done in 2015 by Medicare, Puerto Ricans from the mainland reported higher rates of having access to care in terms of knowing they could go to a hospital and a doctor, they could identify that, but they, uh, as compared to other Puerto Ricans from the island and other Hispanic populations, they reported that they were less satisfied with uh, the ease of getting to the doctors from their homes. And data from the National um, Health Interview Survey from 2010 to 2014 demonstrated that compared to other Hispanic and non-Hispanic adults, Puerto Rican consistently reported poor health status were more likely to report chronic conditions. When asked if they could go shopping, to the movies, to sports events, right? They were more likely to report restriction of social participation. They were twice as likely to report psychological distress in the last 30 days. And they were twice as likely to report, and three times more likely to report as compared to Hispanic, twice as compared to non-Hispanic whites, that they were unable to work due to health problems. And what are risk factors? Well, of course, language literacy. That's the first one. 62% of Puerto Ricans in the mainland say that they speak something other than English at home. We assume it's Spanish because that's our first language, but you know th this is the um, question as it is in the survey. And 17% state that they don't speak e English fluently. So you have like a, almost 20% of patients from Puerto Rico or Puerto Rican descent that don't speak English fluently. Poverty and employment status, 26% live below the poverty level, which is half of the poverty level of the island, but it's still a very high percent of poverty level, and 8% are unemployed. And cigarette smoking, for example, is higher among Puerto Rican males than any other adults from Hispanics and whites, and more than three times more mainland Puerto Rican women smoke while pregnant as compared to other Hispanic populations. As compared to other Hispanic populations, Puerto Rican women have more hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and obesity. And as compared to other Hispanic populations, Puerto Rican adults, male or female, have more diabetes, a higher prevalence, heart disease, and asthma. In fact, children and adults from Puerto Rico and from Puerto Rican descent have twice the prevalence of asthma than any other group in the U.S. and alcohol consumption. And what are the 10 leading causes of death? In 2017, they were pretty much the same for non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics, except for pneumonia and influenza for non-Hispanic whites and chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, cirrhosis for Hispanics. And it's interesting because Hispanic mortality is usually less than for non-Hispanic whites, but from the Hispanic population, 
Puerto Ricans have a higher prevalence of death from all these causes, from all causes. Paradoxically, I have to mention that Puerto Ricans actually have a higher rate of reporting they have health insurance as compared to all. So they have the health insurance, but they have more risk factors and they die more. All right. And what are specifically um, the mortality rates of mainland Puerto Ricans as compared to other Hispanics? Cancer, diseases of the heart, unintentional injuries, Alzheimer, influenza, homicide, infant mortality, septicemia, asthma, and diabetes. And diabetes is very similar to Mexicans. It's twice as the rest of the population. And let's use New York as an example, since you're all here, and this is your population. The Department of Health and, Human, uh, and Mental Hygiene of New York City published a study, and it's called Health of Latinos in New York City. Have anybody heard of it, read it? You should, it's very interesting, I learn a lot. And all of the Latinos populations are there, and they highlight what is important for every group, all right? So from the 8.4 million total population of New York City, 2.4, identify as Latino and 30% identify as Puerto Rican. And 53% of Puerto Ricans in New York City live below the 200% of the poverty um, line level. And that means that in New York, they're more poor than they are in the island and in the rest of the US, in New York City. Um, and they have 30, only 32% have less than a high school education. So. And as compared to other groups within Hispanic groups here in New York City, Puerto Ricans in New York City have a higher incidence, of course, of cigarette smoking. We know that, and that's for all. Um, obesity in high school students, asthma, intimate partner violence, infant death, premature death, dying before 65 years old, unintentional drug overdose, and reporting serious psychological distress. So now we will proceed to discuss some cases that bring into focus some of the situations. And here's the thing, you are discussing the cases with me. So I'm gonna read them and then you're all gonna, you know, we're gonna do this interactive because it's kind of boring if we don't do, you know, an interactive um, activity. So for each case, you are going to discuss the health problems of the patient, explain risk factors contributing to the health, identify any problem with access to healthcare, and then discuss different ways to improve the healthcare of the patient that we're discussing. We're discussing three cases and we're starting, starting with Jose. So Jose is a 23-year-old man born in Hunts Point, a neighborhood in South Bronx. He's the oldest of four siblings and was raised by a single mother. She worked two jobs and couldn't afford childcare, so Jose would stay with neighbors in the apartment building. Although his mother grew in, up in Puerto Rico and speaks Spanish fluently, Jose only knows a few words, usually the name of different foods. However, he's proud of being Puerto Rican and has a flag hanging in his bedroom window. You are now called to the ER of your medical center in the Bronx, where Jose is being evaluated for fever and shortness of breath. While taking his history and physical examination, Jose reports he has a history of asthma, for which he sometimes uses the pump, and although he gets shortness of breath and cough frequently, he has no health insurance or money for medications. After developing report, Jose confides in you, I always had to be responsible for my younger siblings growing up and it bothers me that I never had the opportunity to be a kid, you know? When I got to high school, I started smoking weed to stop feeling angry all the time. Someone in the neighborhood told me to try snorting heroin and I realized it worked better than weed. I started injecting it for a better high. The first time I overdosed, I was brought to a local hospital. Jose also tells you that at the time, he was discharged without seeing a social worker or being referred to a syringe exchange program. When asked about his drug use, Jose responds, I reuse needles and borrow them from others because I would rather save my money for heroin. A nurse brings you the x-ray and laboratory results taken when he first came to the emergency room. The results show Jose has a low white blood cell count, and the chest x-ray indicates a pattern of infections consistent with pneumocystis urovesci, a nasty defining illness. So now, 
what health problems those POSA presents. Who wants to start? Like Hector said, I'm a teacher. <laughs> this is what I do in my okay. school. So, what health problems can you identify? Asthma, asthma, uncontrolled asthma, asthma. asthma. Um, possible AIDS, yeah. Uh, possible depression. Possible depression. What else? Hmm? Substance use and abuse. Very good. Okay. Anything else? More or less that covers it. Very good. And possible pneumocystis geroeci, which would be an AIDS defining illness, HIV. Okay, and what are the risk factors that you can identify that contributed to these problems? IV drug use. He's an IV drug user. Mm -hmm. health he has no health insurance. Yeah. Low socioeconomic status. Low socioeconomic status with includes probably not having access to health care or good um, care. What else? A lot of responsibility for younger. Mm -hmm. Anything else that places him at risk? He might be homeless, right? Sometimes live with some friends. So homelessness is also a risk um, contributing to his um, health care problems. And asthma, in a way, it's a genetic predisposition that Puricans have. So he comes with that just because of his genes. So can you identify some of the problems that Jose can have with um, accessing health care? Or he already had accessing health care? He has no insurance. But he went to an ER. No social worker, no. Do you? Uh, uh, if you don't have social workers, do you know whom else can you call? Who else can help you? Have you heard of promotoras de salud? Health workers, we'll talk about that in a while because there are some resources that are free and are not dependent on um, insurance, right? So he was not um, sent to a social worker or to a syringe exchange program, right? Those are important points of his health care. And then, what can be done to improve Jose's, um, the health care he's receiving? What could you do, you? With the resources you know you have, you maximize the resources, what could you do with Jose? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how would you do that? Just so they, they learn, so, how, to uh, who would you connect? refer them to um, the clinic in case Jose is your patient because have you ever had a patient like Jose? Have you ever met a patient like Jose? Do you think you will by the time you finish medical school? I think you will. Okay, so let's go to Yesenia. And Yesenia is a 30, 40-year-old Puerto Rican woman that visits a student-run clinic and states she cannot speak English. Um, the nurse note indicates her height is 5 feet 2 inches and weight 210 pounds. Vital signs are a heart rate of 110, blood pressure 135, 92, respiratory rate 20, temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. You are a bilingual medical student and Yesenia was assigned to you for evaluation. During the interview, you learned that Yesenia was born, raised, and lived until recently in a rural part of Adjuntas, a town in the mountains of Puerto Rico. She lived in a wooden house with her husband and children. When asked about her medical care and medical history, she responds, I am poor, 
so I only have the government health plan. I used to go to my general doctor every six months. He told me that I need to lose weight, but I try and try and always gain weight. I think it may be because when I'm anxious, I eat more. He also said that I needed to get treatment for my anxiety and refer me to a psychiatrist, but I never went because all the psychiatrists who accepted my insurance were no longer accepting new patients. I couldn't afford to see the doctors outside of my network, so I never received treatment. After empathizing with her frustration, you ask her about the circumstances leading to her move to the United States. And she confides, after Hurricane Maria, we were cut off from water, electricity, and communications. My husband was in dialysis before the hurricane, but we couldn't get him treatment. About eight days after the hurricane, he started having dizziness and chest pain. Because the roads to our home were closed off, there was no way for me to take him to the hospital. My husband died suddenly. I couldn't take the pain of remembering what happened, so I moved here with my children because my cousins live here. As she cries in silence, you wait patiently before asking what brings her into the clinic. And she says, I have recurrent nightmares where my husband clutches his chest and begs me not to let him die. I sleep all the time and cry at random times, and I feel like I'm a bad mother. My children are taking the move easier than I am. In Puerto Rico, I participated in my local church and had a large support system. Here, I have nothing. I wish I could see a general doctor and a psychiatrist, but you're the first doctor who has been able to speak with me. Do you think I can use my Medicaid card from Puerto Rico here? Can you help me? So, um, so what do you think his Yesenia's health problems are? First of all, Yesenia is, is a patient. She could be anyone after Hurricane Maria. One of the Vikings at one of our medical schools actually had her dad dying in her house and she couldn't get him anywhere. So it did happen a lot. Um, and so this is a normal case after a hurricane in Puerto Rico. So what health problems do you think um, Yesenia presents? Trauma. What else? Before? Yes. Hmm? PTSD. She's at least some signs of PTSD. Yeah. Anxiety. As a precursor, she seems like she's always had anxiety. Depression. Depression. Yeah. What else? Obesity. Obesity. Yes. Definitely. Puts her at risk for most of the conditions that Africans usually die of. Um, and what are the risk factors that you think contribute to all her problems? Displacement. She lived in, uh, you don't need to know where Atuntas is, but it is in the middle of the island and it is very hard to get there in a good day because of the streets. There's no hospital surrounding it. It's just a small clinic which is extremely similar to a student-run clinic, but is with a generalist. Generalist in Puerto Rico, finished medical school, did one year of internship, and they take care of patients. So there's no subspecialist, right? So that's the patient you're getting, right? You, you, you do need to ask, how was your health care? Because that'll get you an idea of if they are getting the health care they need. And as Glenn said, Medicare and Medicaid inequalities actually cost a lot of inequalities in terms of the care we get. So um, she, did ha she hasn't received care for what? Her psychiatric, Her psychiatric problems, which she identifies as anxiety, and it seems that way. And what else? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it might be that is the first time, but when you look at it all, it might be that, yes, she's hypertensive, not being treated, right? and her PTSD right now, like you said, right? Okay. So um, what do you think right now are the impediments for Yesenia to get the health care she needs? Language, language barriers. She speaks no English. So what do you do with a patient that speaks no English? What do you do? Get an interpreter. You get an interpreter and if there's none available, that's, that's hard. <laughs> There's not a right answer to that. But sometimes that's how we work, is reality. 
So another alternative. Have you heard of medical Spanish? Have you heard the terminology medical Spanish? A lot of medical schools are starting medical Spanish in Greek language because we have lots of Spanish speaking patients in this same um, situation, right? And Puerto Ricans actually speak English more than other Hispanic populations. So medical Spanish is one way that the provider knows that you know Spanish. Um, how, how else can you help her? How would you help her? What would you do with her? And this is a student-run clinic, so this could really be your patient. You're in second year, right? Most of you are in second year. What would you do? to refer her to a GP clinic so she can get the care she needs. And you will probably also need a social worker to work with her because do you know if she can use her Medicaid card here? It's supposed to work, but the, the reports that came out after Maria was that most hospitals didn't know, so nobody knew really what to do. And I can't remember the hospital in New York that actually started um, putting flyers and news that they did so, so that the people in Puerto Rico could tell um, their families here, go to this hospital. I thought that was a really good PR tactic because you know that was one of the reasons um, that a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans relocating went to that hospital. Um, so it's hard to get the help you need if you don't know where the resources And because FEMA did give money, at least for hurricane survivors in the U.S., they give some money so that you can, you know, uh, live someplace while you get some um, permanent housing. But it's it, it, you don't get it immediately. So most of the population that relocated did not get it immediately. So 
All right, so let's go to our last patient, and it's Eugenio. Eugenio is a 78-year-old man, born and raised in Guanica, in a poor rural area of Puerto Rico, where he still lives alone with his wife. He's retired and lives in a modest fixed income of around 20,000 a year. He usually gets health care at the nearest center for diagnostic and treatment, which is like a student-run clinic, but with general practitioners, um, which he, Exactly. And thus, healthcare is limited and mostly does not include specialists. He's not compliant with appointments because he says no readily available transportation. A few years ago, Eugenio was diagnosed with high blood pressure and was prescribed medications to control it. When asked about the blood pressure medication, he states the following I have three or four medications, but that doctor's crazy. I don't feel sick, so why should I take all those pills? Also, my insurance charges too much money for the deductible if I buy all of them. I usually only take one of them. He has a regular Puerto Rican diet consisting of eating eggs, bacon, and coffee in the morning, rice and meat for lunch, and fried chicken and mofongo for dinner, as an example. Since retirement, he has led a sedentary lifestyle. Two weeks ago, Eugenio developed severe headache. His wife called an ambulance, which arrived 30 minutes later and took him to the nearest hospital in San Germán, which is a secondary care hospital, without only an urgent care. He was found with a blood pressure of 110, 185 and hemiparesis of his left arm and leg. A CT scan revealed a hemorrhagic stroke. The hospital didn't have any neurosurgeons, so Eugenio was transferred to the San Juan Medical Center. And there, he was seen with neurosurgery, cleared of any need for surgery, and admitted to the internal medicine ward, and received appropriate treatment, education regarding why his medication is important, he should take the three pills, and evaluation by the PMR service. Eugenio is ready for discharge as his blood pressure is controlled, and he understands the importance of taking all his medications. Although he's still worried about the cost, PMR recommends transfer to a rehabilitation facility. You are called to his room because he wants to share his concerns regarding this plan. I am worried about the weakness in my left arm and leg. The doctors are going to send me to a rehabilitation but it is too far from my wife, who has no transportation. She also depends on me to do work around the house. Now I wonder if I will ever be able to walk again. Now this is a case in Puerto Rico, and the reason we include this case is because we want you to see that it's mostly very similar, the problems that we have. And if you look through what, what health problems does Eugenio has, biggest health problem. High blood pressure, yeah. Not taking his medication for high blood pressure. Right now, that compounded into. Oh, now he has hyperesis, and PMR is doing his job, as you could see. You know, he went to the medical center, that's where I work, medical school's there. And we're pretty good at finding the resources and telling you to do this and do that. But then this happened. He has no way of getting there. His um, wife cannot get it. So we just wanted to use this as um, rubber so you could know that it's the same thing for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico due to the limited resources that we have in Medicare, Medicaid, and doctors, period. We don't have enough doctors. And now um, doctors are even moving more to Puerto Rico. So for that, we are going to end up with some recommendations. And those are the last two slides. So what can we do to improve the health of Puerto Ricans here in the mainland? The first is eliminate language barriers. Work with interpreters. Increase the amount of Spanish speaker providers. Printed educational material in Spanish. Ask about recent migration and address the stress related to it. And recent can be one month, six months, one year. It almost take two to three years to stabilize. Screen for asthma, diabetes, HIV, and mental health disorders. Provide mental health counseling and treatment, like doctor said, and engage women in early prenatal care because babies do die more frequently. Counsel patients in high-risk behavior, including smoking cessation, alcohol consumption, weight control and diet, substance abuse and use of birth control, and work with the community health workers like we were told, promotoras de salud, so they can educate the population about available services. And there's lots of 
community-based groups here in New York, in New York City. And these promotoras, they help the patients get um, low cost or free care and education and screening. And then implement quality improvement projects to identify and address health disparities within your Hispanic communities. And this is not only for Puerto Ricans. So there are some examples of um, groups within their uh, hospitals and their offices doing focus group asking the patients what are their access to care problems and then stratifying by the different Hispanic group to see if it works um, in their favor and they can help them. And with that, we'll finish. Any questions? Any questions? Perfect. Well, then I'm going to leave Dr. Sanchez to give a final announcement to all of you because there is a leadership and academic regional conference from Bengap here in Cornell in October 12th. So come on. So um, you may be aware that um, your Dean of Diversity, Dr. Budin Foster, will be speaking at the upcoming um, engagement and leadership conference at Wild Cornell. Wild Cornell is covering free registration. So if you are a medical student resident or fellow who's interested in attending, please register online um, by October 7th. The event is October 12th. Um, it would be great to have you there. And it's really about how do you facilitate change in the medical school? How do you serve as a leader and how do you facilitate change? Um, and then lastly, um, if you're doing great work as a leader um, in the medical school, either as a medical student resident or fellow, um, you can be nominated for a leadership award at the upcoming 10th anniversary the Bing Gap Conference. Um, award applications are due um, October 15th. And let me end by thanking Dr. Silva again and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at Downstate for supporting this event. Thank you.